Hey, it's Justin Harvey. Thanks for tuning in to the Anesthesia and Pain Management Success Podcast. With APM Success, we take a close look at important topics pertaining to business, practice management, personal finance, and careers for anesthesiologists and pain management physicians. We work hard to take your critical questions straight to the experts. Thanks for listening. Hello and welcome to episode 167 of APM Success. This week I'm republishing an episode, an early conversation with Dr. Nirmala Abraham. Dr. Abraham was somebody I met at one of the ASRA pain meetings, the um, the practice management session specifically, and it was clear to me, it was clear early on that she was really an expert and had uh, a robust understanding of the business side of pain. And then subsequently, what was really fun for me to discover is that many other guests on this show and many other friends and, and colleagues also looked to Dr. Abraham as a trusted resource and guide and mentor. So the conversation today is getting into different sites of service and helping physicians understand what is the difference between an office-based practice and or surgery center and what we're going to talk about today, which is how do you start an HOPD, a hospital outpatient pain department. So hopefully today's conversation will be enlightening in that regard in a little bit of a different way. And the content, uh, we sort of dive right into it. Uh, so you'll, <laughs> you'll notice the conversation, we just get right up to speed. And that was another fun thing about talking to Dr. Abraham. As soon as we started chatting, we just kind of, <laughs> we got right into it. So that's what you're going to hear. Uh, hope you enjoyed today's episode and thanks for tuning in to APM success. So basically, um, when, you know, as soon as you're 14 and can get a work permit, you know, that's, that's how we roll in our family. It's like, okay, you do what you got to do, yep. get a job, be yep. productive, even though you're still in high school, but whatever, yeah. you know, that's just what you did. Yep. And so as it turns out, you know, family business for me was healthcare. Um, at that point, my father had been in hospital administration in a couple of local hospitals in the DC area. Cause I was, I was born and raised in Maryland. Um, so that's home. And um, so he had a healthcare management company that he had started up. And so that's where I worked. And my first jobs were typing up and editing contracts for the DC government for his home nursing company. Wow. So I did that and I worked in the home nursing agency. I helped do marketing and we would go to doctor's offices because this was, you know, this is old school. This is like, you know, 1987. Right. So we're literally having to get signatures on pieces of paper for the order. So we were driving around to doctor's offices to do that. And, um, and then he had a nursing school. So I worked in the nursing school. I did billing. I turned, you know, wow. I typed up the forms for Medicare to submit for the um, home nursing billing. And wow. so like, literally that's been my whole life. And then in college, I got a job outside of the family business working in a doctor's office. Okay. So I was doing blood draws. I was reading Holter monitors at the cardiologist side of the practice and um, checking in patients, checking out patients, scheduling, doing authorizations. And so I did that in college. Okay. And it's like, oh yeah, by the way, I did actually want to be a doctor since I was 12. So I'm not sure how this will ever be relevant, but okay, now it's time for med school. Yeah. And, you know, get through that. And then all of a sudden, you know, and I, I did a public health major, I picked up a business minor, okay. and then go into med school. And then all of a sudden, I get out into practice. And it's like, Oh, wow. That's all really pretty helpful stuff. Yeah, that I managed no to do. No kidding. So we'll just, if it's okay with you, we'll just kind of keep it rolling. Yeah, that's um, fine. So to be so it sounds like your first experience in contracts yes. and in billing started yes. when you were 14 years old. That is correct. <laughs> well, that would explain yes. the the deep expertise with which you're communicating. Right. right. Um, so, that, yeah. That so, can't and, be replaced. Experience can't be replaced in yeah. stuff like this because you don't find this in books. This is all you live and learn it. Absolutely. And the business minor, I'm sure, helped as well. It did because it gave me some of the basics um, in terms of how to look at you know, a spreadsheet and how do you look at a financial analysis of a program? And it's basics, you know, it's yeah. not, you know, high end stuff, but just knowing, you know, this is accounts payable, this is accounts receivable, this is how the two work together. And this mm -hmm. is how you allocate, you know, your funds. And this is, you know, how you process that. And even, you know, the 
you know, HR 101, how do you staff? How do you communicate with different personality types? And how do you, you know, keep people motivated and, and all of that? So, you know, just these little things that I kind of picked up along the way have ended up making a pretty significant difference. Yeah. And that has been for you, coupled with a real heart and desire to be, I think, a mentor and a yeah. leader and help the help the people coming up behind you, the, the right. physicians who are trying to build their careers and trying to mm -hmm. have this experience or at least right. benefit from this experience to be able yeah. to make great decisions. And that really comes yeah. through when you communicate. So talk a little bit about, um, you know, the kind of what you're seeing right now, as far as I'll say like resident and fellow preparedness. Uh, cause mm -hmm. one of the reasons that this podcast exists is because of this, what I, what I call a uh, significant informational asymmetry that exists between right. employers and prospective physician employees uh, or potentially partners. So right. we're trying to, you know, level the playing field. And I know you've tried to do that a lot with a lot of the right. work that you've done. Um, what kinds of things have you seen and what kinds of mistakes have, have physicians been making in this, in this context? And, you know, what are, what are the things that we should be aware of? Well, I think, um, What's so tricky right now is the difference between what you are doing in your training and what you ultimately end up doing when you get out into the real world. Um, you know, I, I, I always catch myself saying, oh, you know, when I was in training, it was so different. You know, like everybody does that. Every generation yeah. does that to the next group coming up. But I was one of the last ones that did not have the 80 hour work week. So there were no limits in how long they kept us there. You know, you lived it. And granted anesthesia was a little bit more forward thinking because we are literally life and death. Yeah. And so they did recognize that, okay, if you've been up all day and all night working, you do need to go home and rest. You're not going to be working for the next 67 hours and then get like four hours to sleep and then come right back. Um, <laughs> it was nuts. I mean, it just, you know, but with anesthesia, that didn't happen. Um, and so we did have that. But in so many ways now, even when I'm watching internal medicine residents go through uh, the hospital where I work, they do have a residency. And I actually did my internship here. That is part of what ended up connecting me back to this community, but you don't get that real world experience right? because you are working a 16 hour shift and then you have to be off for eight hours and then you come back. And so there is a disjointedness to training now where you didn't have that before. And so you had more time and you had that level of connection to people that was a lot more consistent. So you had more time to get the information across and there's so much to learn medically and clinically that where do you fit in what needs to be learned to also thrive as a functioning practice. Right. And with anesthesia, OR anesthesia, it's very different because it's usually a very large group. You have a billing company. You don't have an office per se. So you don't have the overhead issues. You're not dealing with that part of it. You know, the HR stuff you know, that doesn't really apply. And so you're able to have that in, out, you're just there, you do your thing and you go. In pain practice, it ends up being very different because now not only are you not getting the contact hours, but you are going from a field where that wasn't even relevant to the conversation to all of a sudden a one-year fellowship of how to be in the clinic and run an office practice and an interventional practice. And almost no time to figure that out because you blink and your fellowship is done. And then all of a sudden you're joining a group. Right. And then what, or you try to start up your own deal. And then what, where could you possibly have found the time to yeah. learn that? Yeah. And uh, either of those would be sort of polar opposites, probably from a, <laughs> like a clinical model standpoint from the academic center doing a fellowship. Right. And then you've got to move to either a smaller pain group or trying to understand right. how the, the business of pain medicine and how that works. It's because yeah. it's much more relevant uh, in oh, yeah. pain, especially. And there's very little. I was recently, I, I did a talk recently for uh, a fellowship program who they got some of their pain fellows together and we were talking about business dynamics of uh, contracts and of right. different business models and just the like the very basic business 101 that right. you never get in fellowship. 
Yeah. And so, you know, how, how does this idea apply to the pain fellows that you see and that you work with? And how do you try to prepare them with these, uh, call them like street smarts? Right. So I basically do it the way I was taught. Um, and I was really, really fortunate to have an amazing mentor, uh, Mike Ferrante. And uh, I first started working with him during my residency at the University of Pennsylvania. And he was the chair of the department there. And I did my pain rotation. And he was just running this phenomenal practice. And it was in the black, busy, basically like a private practice in academics, which is unheard of. That just doesn't happen. That kind of efficiency and that kind of flow, the throughput, you know, it just, it wasn't happening anywhere else. And so I was watching that happen and I thought, okay, this is, this is pretty awesome. And it made sense because that's how my brain works. I'm kind of programmed that way. My parents gave me the genetics for that business systems approach to everything. Yes. yes. Um, and I am so grateful that they did not try to like program that out of me. Um, cause little sidebar kind of funny story with that is, um, my parents went to a, you know, parent teacher conference and, you know, the teacher was like, you know, we really love having Nirmala in our class and, you know, she's so bright and, you know, she's just really a delight. But one thing that we've noticed is that she feels like she needs to be in charge of everything. <laughs> <laughs> and this was in kindergarten. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> and so thankfully, my parents were like, well, you know, we feel that shows good leadership skills. Yeah. And, you know, and they let it go. They did not try to like, I, I have zero recollection of them ever saying, you know what, you should probably dial that back a little bit, you know, learn how to play nice with others and don't really cause too much, you know, difficulty. Like they never did that. They were like, hey, be your best all the time. And if that means you're the one that gets to be in charge of stuff because nobody else can figure out how to do it, then go for it. And so, you know, at a very young age, that's just how I was programmed to be. And so that's how I saw the world. And so, you know, I'm looking at ways to be more efficient, to be more effective. And I saw Mike Ferrante doing that in the program. And knowing that that was a direction that I wanted to go with my career, it just really made sense to me to be a part of that, which of course meant that during my CA three year, he decides to pack up and move to UCLA. So I'm thinking, great. I used to just be able to hop on the train and two hours later, I'm in DC and I'm home with my family. Now I got to move back across the country and do this because to me, I felt like the only way that I was really going to get the training that I wanted for my future was to train with him. Hmm. And so I moved. And so I went to UCLA to do my fellowship. And basically within two or three months of getting there, I was the only one that knew how he wanted things done because I had watched it at Penn. And so we get there and there's nothing in place. There's no process for returning phone messages or, or doing confirmation phone calls for appointments. And none of that was happening. And I he started there in October of 2001. So it was just after 9-11 had happened. Okay. And so he left right after that. I went and interviewed, started that following July. Okay. And I get there and he was like, uh, I need you to help me with this. There is nothing. <laughs> going right here. I need you to like see what the deal is. And so literally within like a month, I'm running the fellowship program with him as a fellow. Wow. So I'm sitting down with the staff and saying, okay, so this is how we take phone messages. Hmm. This is, you know, and I noticed, you know, like a third of patients weren't showing up. I said, okay, so who did the confirmation phone calls yesterday? And they're like, I'm sorry, what? Hmm. I'm like, oh, oh, wow. Okay. We've got to really get this figured out. And so within, you know, a couple of months, he was like, all right, you want the job? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm going to need somebody else here to help me out with this. Cause of course for him, you know, he's big time research, all that stuff. Not that he couldn't be operational, but he needed someone to be operational. And so he just started handing it all over to me. And so what he would do is, okay, here's what we're doing. Here's the patient. We've done the visit. Okay. Fill out the scheduling slip. 
fill out the billing and just hand it to me when you're done. Uh, okay. And so that's, that's what he did. So we learned it. So you did it yourself from the beginning. So it's, okay, here's our scheduling slip. These are the most common at the time, ICD-9 codes. Um, here are the most common CPT codes. And so you're just going to circle this and you're going to do this, and then you're going to turn that in. And then once you've done the work, this is the charge slip for the office visit. And so these are, you know, this is what you do. And so that's what he did. So that's how I learned it. Mm -hmm. And so then it just made sense moving forward to say, okay, what better way to learn than right then when it's happening? Because then it, you get to connect it to something. And so I remember pretty early on, it was probably maybe the third or fourth class that I was teaching of fellows that had come through. Uh, we went to an ASRA meeting and I ran into one of the old attendings from Penn and, and we're talking and, you know, we were discussing how we're having some difficulty getting certain procedures authorized and stuff. And so we're just talking back and forth. And then the fellows afterwards, they kind of looked at me like, um, did you notice that you were you mostly talking in numbers? I was like, what are you talking about? They're like, everything you're, you're, it was all like diagnosis codes and CPT. Like you guys were just going back and forth in code. You weren't really <laughs> using very many words for that conversation because at that point, you know, this was all still very paper based electronic medical records hadn't really taken over. So you just memorized everything. Hmm. And so to them, that was just fascinating. I was like, okay, well, you know, numbers stick in my head. It's not a big deal. I still remember birthdays of people that I went to, you know, third grade with. And um, so to me, it's like, that was just how you were going to learn. So that's how I taught it. I made sure that as each visit was done, I would talk through, okay, this is why we use this code. This is why we are going to phrase the documentation this way. This is how this translates into then being able to get the right authorization because if you don't have the right codes and you don't have the documentation to match it, then you're not gonna get this approved. And that's gonna delay you being able to take care of the patient. Mm -hmm. So it was just an every case by case. And oh yeah, by the way, if you do it this way, it's gonna get denied because this information isn't available. Or if you use this code for this procedure, it'll get denied because the last thing we heard from the billing company is that they're not covering it for that diagnosis code anymore. So it was an on the fly case by case. And then, you know, within a couple, three months, it's like, all right, now you're going to do it. And I'm not going to say a word. And then if I have questions about it, I will ask you and kind of grill you on it. So that's, that was basically what happened to me, how I learned it. And it just made sense to teach it that way as well. Sounds like Absolutely invaluable experience and like an irreplicable uh, learning environment where you came in mm -hmm. as a resident who understood the operations. And, you know, during your fellowship year, you're probably picking up the, the clinical skills yeah. of doing mm -hmm. interventional pain, but you're also right. sort of teaching people how to run the, the clinic at the same time. Yeah. So talk about, uh, you know, there was a transition away from UCLA and yep. uh, you're in Ohio now. Is that right? Okay. I'm in Dayton, Ohio. Okay, yeah. So talk about what it was like to leave the the nest, <laughs> and, um, and it take, was terrifying. And take all of these skills that you had so uh, diligently built up over years, and and right. and sort of do it from the ground up. Right. So, um, like I had mentioned earlier, this is the hospital system where I had done my internship before my anesthesia residency, and so basically, it was one of those situations where. Um, when it becomes clear that God has a different path for your life, um, it's usually a good idea to listen and not try to do the opposite of where he's trying to send you. Um, and realistically, I had always seen myself in a private sector. Um, but I, because of where I was and the opportunity that I had, I stayed on at UCLA because like I said, um, uh, Mike offered me the position pretty early on in the fellowship year. And I started to realize how much I enjoyed that environment. I enjoyed the challenge. Um, I enjoyed the complex cases. I enjoyed the back and forth of 
being challenged by the people that were trying to learn from me because then I could learn from them as well. And we were in an environment where that was being supported. And yes, it was important to be efficient and effective and, and code correctly and maximize our revenue stream. And, you know, all of that was happening. And so I didn't feel like I was missing out on that in any way. And then I had the bonus of having people that I could have these conversations with and have this ongoing dialogue of what is the best practice? What can we do that is now cutting edge and different and all of that? Um, so I had originally thought I'm going to go do my fellowship and then leave, you know, get a ton of world experience and then come back and teach. Mm -hmm. And so I've kind of done it backwards. I stayed, I taught, gave some experience and then went out into the big bad world. And I may end up in academics again. I may just find other ways to teach. I don't know because I still love doing it. Um, how long were you at UCLA before you departed? I was there from 2002 to three as a fellow and then from three to 10 as an attending. Got it. Okay. So yeah, eight and a half total. Okay. And then and, you went from there to Ohio. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So um, basically the oppor opportunity came up that um, they did not have a pain management program affiliated with this health network. And at the time, they were doing more total joints than Cleveland Clinic, and they did not have a regional anesthesia program. They did not have an acute pain service. They had nothing that they needed on the inpatient side. Wow. And in order to, you know, build up all of the certifications for center of excellence and all that kind of stuff, you needed to be able to document that you had certain things in place. And they had a very skeletonized and not really a cohesive program in place. And I really had just come here for a social visit and went to hang out with some of you know, my attendings in, in med ed and went to say hi. And everyone's like, oh, wow, we would love to have someone like you here. I'm like, yeah, I can walk to the beach from my condo. So I probably <laughs> don't need to be back in Dayton, Ohio, um, except like I said, when God starts to open doors and every conversation that I had when I got back to California from this trip was somehow with someone that had lived in or was from Ohio. <laughs> like, okay, I get it. I'm apparently supposed to be going back to Ohio. Um, and as it also turned out, my practice manager at UCLA was born and raised in North Dayton. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so she too had been wanting to come home. I'm like, great. So you wanting to go home is taking me to Ohio instead of to my home in DC. Um, so basically what we did, um, as it became clear that this was a direction that our lives were going to be heading, um, was we drafted a business plan. Mm -hmm. And so she had actually done her MBA while working for our practice. Wow, awesome. And I had helped her with the project. She basically used our office for all of her projects. Um, because it was a healthcare administration focus for her MBA. Okay. And so she would keep picking random things that we needed to improve upon. And then because, you know, back then the Wi-Fi connection um, was not very good at her apartment. So she would stay at the office late to do her homework. And so I would hang around sometimes and help her out with the projects and stuff. And um, so then when the opportunity came up, here, it was basically to start a department from scratch. Hmm. Nothing existed, which was so energizing because all of a sudden we could do exactly what we wanted to do. So everything that we didn't like about what was happening at UCLA, <laughs> we're like, okay, if we are theoretically being given a blank check here, we've got to run with this. Yeah. So we and we went, I mean, all out. We had a program to help us write a formal business plan. So we started off with our executive summary. We did research to find out what the mission statement was for this institution. Mm -hmm. And we basically built the entire business plan around that um, and set up three months, six months, one year, three year, five year, and 10 year projections for what we wanted to do. And what we thought we could accomplish, because at that point, we were pretty close to 10 years at UCLA. Yeah. So we felt like, OK, so we can watch the growth of what we've done here and pretty much replicate that. 
at a new location. So, so we, when you're talking about those projections, is that in terms of like, I guess, patient volume and like revenue to the hospital and different types of procedures and reimbursement, all are you taking it. all that into account? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So we start off with, okay, um, I recognize that what you want is, you know, coverage for orthopedic surgery. And so the recruitment happened because the last person I met that visit happened to be the director of the orthopedic service line for the hospital. Hmm. And so she was like, and, and my friend that I was visiting, she was a trip. She was introducing me to everybody with my credentials. She's like, oh, do you remember? This is Dr. Nirmala Abraham. She did her internship here and she is now the assistant director of pain management at UCLA. And this person heard that intro and she was like, wait, what? Oh, we need to talk right now. Yeah. And so she Lock the door. Asking, We're not letting her out. <laughs> pretty much. Pretty much. That's what she did. And so she's like, okay, so this is what we're trying to accomplish. And this is what's happening. And, you know, I've been trying for about five years now to get this going. And I'm just really having a difficult time. And I just looked at her. I said, um, yeah, what you're doing is never going to work. And she says, okay, why? So I said, well, if you're trying to contract private doctors to come in and provide inpatient services, that is an automatic loss of revenue for them. Because every minute they spend in the hospital is time away from revenue generation in their procedure suite or in their own clinic. So you're never going to get anybody to really commit to this. So what you need is a physician that works here, that is going to have a thriving outpatient chronic pain practice that is interventionally based so they can generate the revenue stream, mm -hmm. which will then support the loss that will happen on the inpatient side because it is going to be a loss on the books, but obviously improved quality of care, right. improved patient satisfaction, decreasing length of stay, all of those other things will ultimately gain you back and will net you a positive. Hmm. And she looks at me and she said, okay, so you explain to me in one minute what no one has been able to tell me for the last five years. Hmm. How does that happen? I said, it happens because this is my life this is what I live. This is what I do. And as the assistant director of a fellowship program, I am required to balance an inpatient experience with an outpatient program. Hmm. And the way we do it, we make it run really well. And we do it very efficiently and very effectively, both clinically and financially. And so this is just, this is all I know. And so she's like, all right, that's what we need here. So that's basically what I did for them is create that model is here's your outpatient practice. This is where the money is going to come from. It generates X amount of dollars on the hospital side with the um, procedural fees and facility fees that come in. It generates this much on the physician side with the professional fees. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is a, a rough estimation of expected volumes and throughput this is what we can do on any given day hmm. and um and so this is the split so is there always this seesaw relationship between the outpatient pain and the you know the inpatient stuff where it's essentially one is subsidizing the other is that kind of the way it works in pretty much they're okay. all yeah because ultimately the amount of time spent in seeing the patients, right. dealing with the inpatient side of it, the rounding and all of that, you're just not going to recoup that time right. and the amount of money that it would cost. Now, you And the other thing is that you cannot have physicians running that side of it. Right. You have to have the advanced practice providers on that side of it because there's no way that you'll be able to come close to generating enough revenue to cover a physician salary on that. Right. Right. But you do come pretty close to a um, PA or nurse practitioner salary, and especially if you're looking at what you end up gaining by reducing your length of stay and improving your quality metrics and, and all of that. Um, so there is always going to be that balance. So whether it's built into the surgery side and the surgery department in the hospital takes on that responsibility or... Um, if there is a separate pain program that is set up, there is always going to be that back and forth and that balance that has to be found. Okay. So it sounds like the HOPD side is the side that kind of got you excited when you're like, right. 
clean slate, blank check. Right. Let's roll up right. our sleeves. So tell right. me about this transition coming back. You're probably like looking for a place to live and then you're oh, you yeah. show up at the hospital and you're like, let's do this. What, what was yeah. that like? So I showed up for my first uh, interview because they, you know, they're like, okay, we want to meet with you and, and see what we think. So I show up and, you know, one of the people from the physician employment side was talking to me about, oh yeah, you know, you know, pain management, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of tough here in this community and we don't really have anybody here. And I said, yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of opportunities and, you know, obviously there it's tricky to balance this and, you know, get the right revenue stream going and all of that. And he just kind of looked at me and I said, well, if this doesn't make sense, I can, you know, here's a copy of my business plan. If that would, you know, help it be more understandable. He's like, I, I don't think I've ever met a doctor that actually knows what any of those words mean. Hmm. <laughs> and he's like, I've definitely never met a doctor that showed up to their interview with a business plan. Yeah. Hmm. And I said, well, that's all I know. Again, it's a brand new department. And to me, there's no better way to explain it than to show you what it looks like on paper. Um, and find that balance of the clinical information to help you understand what we do clinically combined with what does this provide as an added service and added value to the system. So basically, I did six or seven interviews in one day, and every single one of them ended with, okay, what's it going to take to get you here, and how fast can you move? Um, and so that was in April of 2010. Okay. And I moved out here in December. Okay. So yes, let's move back east in the winter time. Yeah, that's, so a, that that's was, a pretty brutal time to be in uh, southern yeah, Ohio. Yeah, it was rough. So basically, I went through like three or four of the top life stressors within like six months because I had to change jobs. I left the only job I ever knew. I yeah. left my mentor. Um, I had to sell my condo in LA. I bought a house out here. I moved. I looked at 13, 14 houses in one day and picked one, signed wow. on it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, all right, let's go. Um, you know, wow. and, and, and that's kind of my sort of how I function. It's like, look, we just need to get this done. So let's look at this. Let's, what do we want? What are the, what are the absolute must haves? What are the, I don't care about this so much. What are the absolute, oh, no way, this is not an option, and and get that going. And there were some houses that I walked in in like 30 seconds, like, nope, we can go on to the next. Um, you know, and that's kind of how I function. But the, yeah. so the service line um, director who ended up managing uh, us for the first few years that I was here, she kind of laughed because when we met with the architects, it was a blank slate. Like, literally, the walls weren't even built yet in the mm -hmm. clinic in that um, – the section that they were allocating for us. So we sat down with the architects and they had a design and I'm like, yeah, you can't put the doctor's office right next to the front desk. That's a really bad idea. Yeah. So let's redesign this and we're going to do this. And then the, you know, the des interior design person is like, okay, here's some ideas I had. I'm like, okay, that one, that one, not that one. We're going to do that. Okay, we're done. And she just looked at me. She said, I have never had anybody figure all of this out that quickly. I said, yeah. yeah, I know what I want. I know what I want. I'm not afraid to ask for it. I'm not afraid to say, no, this is not what I want. So, and there's other more important things to worry about. So let's just keep moving along and yeah. get things going. So it was, you know, it moved along pretty quickly. Was the architect with whom you were working, did they have any experience in op like building a a floor plan to be optimized for, you know, patient flow and a hospital outpatient um, department? <laughs> They thought that sounds they like did. a specialized skill set. Yes, they thought they did, um, but turns out they didn't. Okay. And so, again, having spent a lot of time thinking about, okay, what is the ideal flow? Like we had moved to a couple of different offices when we were at UCLA, and they were in the process of trying to design another space for us to move into. So mm -hmm. the manager that actually ended up coming with me from UCLA to here, we've now been working together for 17 years. Wow which is, that is awesome. unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. And so she and I had, you know, we had, that's what we did because I was running the operational functional side of the practice at UCLA. She was the manager. So we were, you know, hand in hand the whole time redesigning space, looking at what the flow was. Okay. This is horrible. We need to fix this and do this differently. 
So again, when we had the opportunity to design from ground zero, we said, okay, we, we like sort of what you've done, but here's the areas where this doesn't work. And so we sat down with them and kind of redesigned it and explained it, said, okay, if you want the patients to come in here and then the flow needs to go to, you know, the MAs to get them checked in to do this, and then you need to take them to the, room, them to the rooms. And then, you know, you need the clinical space for the physicians. You know, you need office space, admin space, and you want to separate that from patient care areas because you want them to have privacy. You want them to be able to get away from where the patients are to do what they need to do. So the architects had never really even thought about it that way. Hmm. And so when I was talking them through that, they're like, oh, wow, that really does make a lot of sense. Yes. Yes, it does. Now, did you just pick all this up intuitively from your time at UCLA? Is this something that most people who, having worked in a pain department, would be able to intuit? Uh, probably not. I, I mean, I think a lot of people can get bits and pieces of it. But um, one of the things that I've always been able to do is look at the, you know, the 20,000 foot view. Yeah from above and just kind of see all of the parts moving and say, okay, this, this is what would be the ideal. So, um, you know, for as much as I am a very detail oriented person and want X, Y, and Z to be in line, I can also see where if this isn't happening, that's how it is going to impact all of these other things. Mm -hmm. And so, um, there are some parts of it that you would just be able to figure out like, yeah, you definitely don't want the break room to be right next to the patients. You don't, you know, there's certain things that you would just figure out yeah. were poorly thought out. Right. But then there's other little details that you may not think of in terms of layout and, you know, where where is the most efficient location for the medical assistant? Where do you want the scheduler to be? How do you want check in and check out to flow in the front desk space? And, you know, there's a lot of that that, physicians don't necessarily think about because to them, they're handed a chart. They walk into an exam room and that's it. Like yeah. that's all they think about. They don't think about all of the steps that it takes from when the patient walks through the door and then they have to be, you know, guided through this visit. Not everybody's going to even bother to think about it that way because most physicians, that's not relevant to them. Yeah. Were there right. any other resources that you had to draw from in order to answer some of these questions? Not really. It was just kind of a, like I said, live and learn it. Yeah. Um, and just and watch then, it happen. Yeah. After the layout was kind of configured, talk a little bit about, you know, getting outfitted. And then how long was it until you had patients coming in the door? So I started in mid January and the first patients um, were by the end of February. Okay. So um, we got here, uh, the clinic was not quite finished. We did not have phone lines. They did not have a phone number yet. So that means we didn't have business cards. So I couldn't do the marketing that I had initially hoped to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I did start getting out and meeting some of the doctors at the hospital level, uh, met with some of the orthopedic surgeons that were there um, and talked about the fact that, yes, we're starting up the outpatient program and we'll eventually be providing inpatient services, but it's just me right now. Mm -hmm. um, I did have a nurse practitioner that was hired part time. Um, but, you know, this was going to be a huge undertaking because it was just me yeah. as a physician and in a specialty that the hospital didn't have. And what I did not know at the time was that Dayton was in the midst of their opioid crisis peaking. And I had no idea it was that bad. Yeah. And within months of getting here, House Bill 93 passed, which is the one that cracked down on the pain clinics and what was a definition for a pain clinic. And so all of a sudden you had a bunch of practices that were trying to get rid of all of the patients that they'd been prescribing opioids to for years. Right. And then on the inpatient side, they saw so much in the way of complications from drug use, IV drug use. Um, overdoses and all of that. And so all of a sudden, um, the inpatient side became a lot more complex. And the outpatient referrals were also a lot of people just trying to dump off on the newest pain practice in town. Let's get rid of these patients. Yeah. Um, so I got out, I started meeting with people, um, told them the outpatient practice was starting up and hopefully in three to six months, we'd get some inpatient stuff going. 
Yeah, except that the first patient I saw was an inpatient hmm. because one of the first surgeons that I met with had a patient that was on methadone hmm. and was getting a knee replacement. And he had no idea what to do for a post-op pain control for a patient that's been on methadone. And so, you know, everything got flipped completely upside down and I ended up starting both the inpatient and outpatient at the same time. Huh. So, so what that strat- was oh, go ahead. challenging. Yeah, no kidding. What strategies did you find to be most constructive as you're trying to get the name out there that, you know, we have a, uh, an outpatient pain clinic now and we want, we're trying right. to get patient volume up so we can like pay for this big shiny new facility that we just right. built. Right. How, how did you go about doing that? So, um, basically I just had to tell them a little bit about what I was going to be doing and how it was going to be different from the other practices in the community. Um, at the time that I got here, I believe there were 22 or 23 providers that were calling themselves pain management and only six of them with me included were actually fellowship trained and board certified. Wow. Everybody else was some variation of primary care, anesthesia, something, and had sort of grandfathered into doing pain management because, you know, they went to a few weekend courses and stayed at a Holiday Inn Express, and all of a sudden they got to call themselves pain doctors. Um, And that's kind of the terrifying thing about the specialty is it is still very um, fluid in terms Hmm. of who is allowed to call themselves pain management. Hmm. and the certification that's required. Now, Ohio has tried to tighten up on that, but that doesn't change the fact that there are still several practices that are grandfathered in. Um, And so we still kind of struggle with that. But, you know, I did let them know, uh, yes, I do moderate prescribing, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. This is going to be an interventional focus. Uh, My philosophy is functional restoration, And that means we are looking to do things that will actually help the patients be better and be stronger and be more interactive in their lives. Um, And so that happens in a variety of ways, mostly with us doing interventions and things that are going to more directly go after the pathways that are creating the pain, meds when appropriate, treatment oriented, not so much on the opioid side. Um, and, you know, just let them know kind of the range of what I could do. And now, when you're saying let them know, who is the them to whom so you So the them was mostly surgeons. I started off okay. meeting with um, the orthopedic surgeons, spine surgeons. Is this surgeons. all in the hospital? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So in the hospital, um, affiliated with the system. Okay. Um, and then I did some lectures. I did some grand rounds and, and some different things to sort of let people know what I had to offer. Mm-hmm. Um, and then on the inpatient consult side, same thing. You know, it's mostly going to be acute on chronic pain. Um, some, you know, mostly post-op, honestly, mm-hmm. at the beginning, Uh, But like I said, the minute they had somebody that they knew was in the hospital, all of a sudden it was like the floodgates, like, oh, you know, this person is addicted to heroin and now they're having a surgery. So you need to take care of that. Uh, Okay, not licensed in addiction medicine, not going to be managing the addiction, can help you as much as I can, but Mm -hmm. there's not a whole lot to offer. Um, So there were a lot of challenges with trying to get the scope um, more established. And that was hard because at the beginning, everybody wanted a dumping ground. Yeah, They just wanted to be able to hand it off and we don't want to deal with this. We don't want any calls. You just have to handle all of it. It's like, okay, again, I am one person. I am literally on call 24 seven. I can't see every single patient that is expected to be seen. Like we have to do more education. Everybody needs to do their part. Um, and I, it was brutal. I mean, I had some people that would just rip me apart and for as much as, you know, everyone wants to think that physicians are all very appropriate and very polite, very professional to each other, man, that borderline personality comes right out because if you give them what you want, you are the savior. If you don't, you're Satan. Yeah. And I had people rip me apart. Well, what's the point of you even being here? It's yeah. just a waste of time and money to even have you here if you're not going to do what I tell you to do. I'm like, 
okay, would you as the surgeon appreciate having somebody tell you what you have to do? Like, it doesn't work that way, which as an anesthesiologist, we're kind of used to that. That is a little (laughs) bit of what people think they get to do to us anyway. Yeah. Um, but there, there were times where it's like, all right, I am going to just have to hold my ground because if I don't, I will get steamrolled. And yeah. anybody that joins the group moving forward will just get steamrolled. So um, it was tough at the beginning. Did you have any low points or points when you were like, I'm in over my head and I'm not sure this thing is going to work? Or, or maybe a less dramatic version of that? Oh, there were many of those. Yeah. And, um, can you maybe t- tell one or two anecdotes about just some of the challenges you encountered? Um, okay. Yeah. So w- when I first got here, you know, the system was just growing in terms of the employment model and, and getting people onboarded and all of that. And they hadn't really onboarded a lot of physicians from outside of the community. Mostly it was acquiring practices that were local. And so you know, getting my credentialing done and all of that. There were a lot of challenges that came up with that. Um, And they were, you know, just figuring out their processes. They hadn't really done that very, very much at that point. So, you know, with all of the stresses of getting here, building the new department, trying to get the word out and, you know, trying to figure out what's going on, um, I actually broke out in hives. Wow. From the yeah, stress. I mean, from the stress. And I, and I was fine. Like, I mean, I was exercising. I was working out. I was doing everything that I could think of yeah. um, to manage the stress. But I just broke out in hives. And one of my good friends had done her internship with me here was in primary care. So I went and I saw her and, you know, she gave me some antihistamines. I was on four different antihistamines. <laughs> and still totally functional. Not at all sedated. Not Hopefully at, like, not operating no. any heavy machinery or anything. Right. But not, <laughs> it didn't, I like, I, I, and I still couldn't sleep. Wow. And so I go to the pharmacy to fill the prescription and they're like, oh, I'm sorry, your benefits aren't actually entered in the system right now. And I'm like, what? Hmm. So um, I didn't have benefits. Um, so they didn't have me entered into HR. Um, I ended up not getting my first paycheck because payroll didn't have me in there. <laughs> and it all happened. Like the day we were supposed to open, there was an ice storm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's funny because I'm thinking back to 2010. I I was at Villanova in Philadelphia and I'm thinking about, we had the, we called it the snowpocalypse of 2010. I don't know if, I think, I don't know if that hit Ohio at all, but we got like that two days in a row where it was like 12 inches of snow both days. And yes. it was just very yeah, so this was ten. Yeah, this was 10 going into 11. And I can't remember. We didn't get a ton of snow, but we had a lot of ice. Okay. Um, but yeah, it was, it was bad. It wow. was bad. And I'm like, okay, um, I must be, all I had to keep telling myself was, all right, I must be doing something right because the universe is trying to destroy me right now. Yeah. So clearly I'm on the right path. Yeah. I just need to figure out how to manage this. Um, so like little things like that would happen. And I'm like, okay, I'm good. I'll be fine. I think it says a lot about your personality that that's how you interpret that. That as things get tougher, right. you're like, this is a sign that I need to keep going. Right. <laughs> yeah. And people would look at me, they're like, are you serious about that? Like, hey, yeah. you know what? This is how I'm choosing to cope with this right now. Because the other option would be to curl up into a little ball in a corner and cry. Right. And that's not me. So yeah. we're going to go with this instead. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. So there were you know, things like that that happened. Um, you know, it was tough building up the patient volume. It just, it took time. Um, and the starting over being eight years out of training and, you know, just having to build up everything, it was tough because there was that part of me that was like, okay, maybe I do need to just start taking everything and not, you know, screen patients and not be more careful about what I'm letting into the practice. But then I just knew that that was going to set me up for more problems in the future. Mm-hmm. So I just made the choice to say, okay, we're going to stick with our vision, with our plan, with how we want to do things. Um, and then just let that eventually build up into a reputation that makes people want to send their patients here. And it worked. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was, it was not easy at the beginning. And yeah, there were definitely times where I felt like, I don't know if this is going to go anywhere. Um, I would go to some of the meetings with orthopedic surgeons and the top operating surgeon wouldn't even talk to me. Hmm. 
Because, and, and understandably, because they'd been burned so many times by people that had come in and said they were going to do pain management for them. And then they didn't, they Hmm. would be there for eight months, a year, and then they'd bail. Hmm. And so he didn't have any faith that this was actually going to play out. So he was like, eh, well, am I going to bother? Um, but I would keep showing up at the meetings and, and working with them. And then I had a second nurse practitioner that joined me at the end of 2011. And she was amazing. Um, had a ton of experience doing pain management at one of the other hospital systems in the community and mostly on the inpatient side. And so she was helping me looking at the order sets for all the different surgical service lines and kind of revamping things and and kind of building up some of the gaps that they had here. And she turned to me maybe two or three months into being there. And she just looked at me. She's like, what were you thinking? I, I was like, what? And she's like, this job, what is the matter with you? What, hmm. what were you thinking? Taking this job and taking on all of this, like, this is insane. I said, well, I just figured when the time was right, the right people would show up and here you are. So off we go. Yeah. <laughs> and, and she's like, okay, but you're nuts. Like you're insane. Okay, maybe I am, but that's probably what it takes to do this job. So I'm okay with that. Um, And within a year, year and a half, that same surgeon um, that wouldn't even, you know, acknowledge my existence, all of a sudden wouldn't do anything if I wasn't there. Like as soon as there was something that had to happen with pain management, he was like, well, what does Dr. Abraham think? And I'm like, "Uh, okay, well, what about this? Okay, that's good. We'll do that. Um, and when they had to revamp some policies with um, extended care and home care and things like that, you know, part of it was going to revolve around how do we make sure that we transition the right pain processes and protocols from the inpatient side to the outpatient side. And he was like, well, Dr. Abraham has to be at that meeting mm-hmm. because that's going to be really important for us to transition that over as well. Um, so that was huge. Um, you know, being able to win someone over like that was yeah. really gratifying. And it did also then lend a lot of credibility to the work that had been done. So that was, that was, that was a big win. Cool. Well, that's, thank you very much for sharing your story, Dr. Abraham. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Um, I have one more question that we'll close with. Sure. And uh, yours is a pretty remarkable story. I love the the fusion of like entrepreneurship and medicine and being able to construct this, this vision that you had. That's, it sounds like a really unique and exciting opportunity. Uh-huh. And I would love to hear just a little story or anecdote about part of uh, a little snapshot into this process when in the midst of, you know, maybe it was like having hives and like the architect doesn't know what they're doing. Like a lot of things, there's a lot of challenges, relationships with surgeons, uh, all along the way. There's a lot of, you know, you said it, like things are just very, very challenging. Right. Tell me about a little snapshot of a moment you had, whether it was with a patient or talking to a surgeon or whatever, when you said, you know what? I can see. I, I think, I think this is going to work. I think we're going right. to make it through. I think that uh, there. I'm going to see ultimate validation of all of my right. efforts. Right. Um, so, I mean, there's so many of those that happen. Um, you know, at multiple levels, and and for me, because I had the academic portion of my life where I did have that opportunity to be a mentor and and to have people. Um, go through the educational process with me, combined with the private sector where I had more of the the professional dynamics. Um, I think on the academic side of it, one of the most amazing moments for me was actually this past fall for ASRA. Hmm. Um, Dr. Andrea Nickel, who was the program chair, was one of my fellows at UCLA. Wow. And so that was huge for me, um, for actually for both of us um, and for women in pain medicine, because I was the last female program chair in 2007. Wow. (laughs) And so there had not been a female chair for the fall meeting um, since me and then her. Wow. And so that was huge to have her do that because I was like, yes, it matters. It totally matters that, you know, we got a good strong woman into our fellowship program and got her trained and she is doing so amazingly well Mm -hmm. at Kansas. And then for what she's doing and what she's accomplishing in the academic world of pain management, that for me was just like, okay, yep, 
what I did, the time I spent in academics, totally worth it. Just completely uh, made cool. that time worthwhile because that is to me as a teacher, the most important thing is that the next generation that comes up behind me is going to set a good and strong example for what needs to happen and how it needs to happen. Um, so that for me on the academic side was amazing. Hmm. Um, on the on the professional clinical side, um, definitely, you know, like having that surgeon go from not wanting to communicate to feeling like, wow, this is so great to have you here and we want to make sure we keep you involved. That was a big moment. And there were several like that where, um, you know, the nurse practitioners that I would work with, they're like, yeah, we're having such a tough time, you know, getting these doctors on board and, and getting them to see the value of what we're doing on the inpatient side. And, um, you know, just being able to communicate with them and, and having those moments of, look, you know, you remember this patient, you guys were having a really difficult time and they're like, oh yeah, you know, this, you know, why don't you come to our next meeting and, and let's talk about what we can do. And um, so having those opportunities to, to make those connections um, and, and help the program advance, that's, that's been huge. And I think um, one of the things that we had also talked about um, at the meeting last fall was what brings you joy. Yes, yes. And um, so I was I was going through my Marie Kondo phase. Um, <laughs> if there's something in your life that's not bringing you joy, then you need to get rid of it. Um, and that's not the way that most people think of their career. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I also feel like in medicine, we have to sacrifice so much to yeah. get to where we are. Um, you know, most people are basically picking up the equivalent of a mortgage in school loans, if not more. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is a huge burden that you carry with you because if this is what you decide you want to do, this is what I wanted since I was 12. I didn't know what that meant at the time. I didn't know what, you know, financially, what that was going to do to me mentally, emotionally, psychologically, I had no idea what impact that was going to have. But what I do know is if, I was not willing to give a piece of me to this job. Um, people would be able to tell hmm. and it, and it would be noticeable. Um, and so, you know, at the beginning, yeah, there's a big part of it, especially now that ends up being about, I got to make money. I got to feed my family. I want to actually drive a car. That's not 15 years old. I, you know, I want to live in an actual house, not an apartment. Yeah. Um, you know, there's all these things that you want to be able to transition into. So at the beginning of the career, a lot of times it's, I got to make the most money that I can possibly make. Okay. But sometimes you end up having to do things that are not necessarily in the best interest of the patient yeah. or of medicine in general to get there. And we all know the stories of people that have had questionable ethics and what they've done and where they ultimately end up. Um, and my fellows, we, they would ask me about that all the time, because especially in LA, there was a lot of people doing shady stuff. And so I would tell my fellows, look, if I find out that you're doing any of this, I will come to your office. I will snatch that diploma off your wall because I will not have you saying to anybody that you trained with us and then you're doing that. Mm. Um, so like figuring out how you want to live your life, what are your priorities, um, and then making sure that you pick a position that is going to make sense for you. So if what you want is to be connected professionally and to be involved with education, then you go that path. Um, if what you want is to be in the private sector and you want to have more of a business model and you want to do that, then, then you look for that. But knowing who you are as a human and then who you want to be as a physician and kind of putting that together um, is going to be very important because mm -hmm. medicine will suck the life out of you very quickly very quickly with what's happening right now. And just today I had one of the most amazing little moments with a patient because it's somebody I've been taking care of for a couple of years. I take care of his wife as well. And he came in for his procedure and he was like, you know what, doc, you are one of my favorite people. I was like, oh, well, thanks. Wow. And he's like, no, seriously. He said, you are so happy. I, whenever I see you, you are happy and you obviously love what you do. Hmm. And he said, you have no idea what a difference 
it makes to have a physician taking care of you when you're hurting like this that really loves being able to do what they're doing. Uh, he said, there's just not enough people. He said, you know, it is such a blessing to be able to do something with your life that you really love to do. Hmm. Um, and, and, that's, and that's something that is so hard to hold on to in any field of medicine, but particularly pain management, because you are constantly faced with people that are suffering. And how do you let people know that you care without absorbing so much that it just makes you jaded and burned out and tired? Um, so I think, you know, those kind of moments when people can reflect that back, it's like, okay, then I'm okay. I, you know, for whatever my frustrations have been, whatever my issues with staffing and scheduling and whatever the disaster of the week happens to be, if the patient is still able to see that I have joy in what I'm doing, then I'm still where I'm supposed to be. Yeah. Um, so that, that little moment today was very validating and very important because we don't get a lot of positives in medicine. We are always being told what we're doing wrong and what standard we're not meeting. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and in the end, it's, most of us still go into medicine because we want to take care of people mm -hmm. and we want to be able to make a difference in people's lives. So, you know, being able to know that that's still happening is, is really pretty cool. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing with us today. And thanks for joining us, Dr. Abraham on the Anesthesia Success Podcast. Yeah, absolutely. If you liked what you heard this week, head on over to apmsuccess.com where you can find more content and free resources to help you build a successful career in anesthesia and pain management. If you wanted to leave a review in iTunes, I'd also really appreciate it. Thanks for using some of your valuable time to join me today on APM Success.